welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Late Night Action with Alex Falcone. Our guest this evening from the Simpsons Mission Hill in Portlandia, Mr. Bill Oakley. We've also got video game designer, Mr. Steve Gaynor. Comedy duo Chase and Stacy. Also, Portland's funniest person, Mr. Shane Torres. And rounding out our show is musical guest, Miss Laura Gibson. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming your host, Mr. Alex Falco. for being here, you guys. Oh, this is going to be such a good show. You guys picked the right night to come. This is going to be awesome. I, we have, I'm so excited for all the guests we have tonight, but we're going to start with some news. Uh, I think one of my favorite stories that I saw this last week uh, was that the owner of the Mr. Formal Tuxedo Shops, you saw this, uh, the owner of Mr. Formal Tuxedo Shops uh, lost his handgun permit because he was pulling out his gun in traffic confrontations. He insisted it was just because you dress for the job you want, not the job you have. <laughs> and the job he wants is trashy Jason Statham, apparently. <laughs> the Oregon Zoo's oldest Asian elephant, Packy, turned 52 this week, which is very exciting. Yeah. Uh, because he's an Asian elephant, though, he only looked 25. <laughs> I don't know how to feel about that either. Uh, <laughs> And I, we got a lot of animal news today, too. I love animal news. Other animal news today. Authorities removed an alligator from a one-bedroom apartment in Washington State where it was being kept as a pet, which is a police action that's referred to as a Florida gentrification. <laughs> Common maneuver. Uh, the owner of the pet was heartbroken, saying she didn't know it was illegal. And then she added, well, that's obviously not true. I mean, I'm a psychopath, not an idiot. <laughs> Uh, the city of Dufer, Oregon, has a removed, they've repealed their ban on roosters after a young girl's fa family rallied to let her keep her pet. Then she said, Mommy, I want a law that says I can have Shannon's bicycle because it's better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> then you shall have your law, said her weird and very effective parents. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Darfur, Sudan, there's still no government. <laughs> The Oregon Ghost Conference was uh, held this week in Oregon City. It was full of a bunch of pale figures who haven't lived in years. Talking about ghosts. <laughs> the problem with that is the only people who already saw it coming, so they laughed a while ago. That's true. That's the uh, although there was a really weird twist at the end of the week. It turns out Oregon City had been dead the whole time. <laughs> Doctors at the Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in North Carolina announced this week that the first ever implement implantation of an entirely lab-grown vagina was a success. Good, yeah. You can read more about this story this week in this month's scientific journal of So Busy Wondering If We Could, We Never Thought About Whether We Should. <laughs> it's a weird publication, you guys. Uh, actually, this is interesting. We actually got our hands on a leaked copy of the updated version of the vagina monologues. I got this. <laughs> Science is a woman. All boiling and bubbling, warming and cooling with test and fallopian tubes. Science. <laughs> My vagina may be man-made, but I am all woman. Free for everybody. Yeah. Pioneering the cowardly fake mic drop. That's, that's a slick maneuver, Brie. Vagina monologues. Yeah, that's what they... Speaking of writing, a, uh, a man who wrote a book about being a pimp was indicted this week in Portland on accusations that he is a pimp. <laughs> what a snitch-ass little book, huh? <laughs> Just because 
because he wrote a book about pimping doesn't mean he's a pimp. I mean, James Frey wrote a book about being in a bunch of pieces, and <laughs> Ann Coulter wrote a book about being a person. <laughs> you can just put stuff in books. They don't check. Uh, dragon boat team this week found a dead body floating in the Willamette River. But they weren't able to pull it off because their upper bodies were so tired. And they had to be at work in an hour. In other news, should we still be allowed to do stuff in this river? That... A brawl broke out. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, a brawl broke out between two Catholic high school baseball teams this week. Uh, one, of the, one of the coaches said he wasn't surprised, you know, they were, both teams were totally drunk, so he was expecting it. <laughs> Actually, the principals of the high schools both said, they agreed, you know, that all the boys feel very guilty about masturbating. They don't care about baseball, but, uh... <laughs> you don't know how you feel about that either, that's fine. Uh, my Catholic mom is not gonna like this when it airs, that's fine. <laughs> It's mostly for you. Uh, Portlanders have been exceedingly slow at paying their arts tax again this year. You guys have been really slow about it. It really is like the Portland equivalent of the prisoner's dilemma, you know? Because, like, on the one hand, we love the arts, but on the other hand, you have to do a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Government officials in Oregon have predicted that if we legalize gay marriage next year, we will uh, have an estimated 6,000 weddings that will help boost our economy. Yeah. Right? It, if you take out the whole social justice part, it's really easy to make the right decision. <laughs> Police are looking for a masked gunman in Olympia, Washington this week who robbed a Toys R Us. Uh, the, the man said, uh, apparently, quote, I want all the Legos, even the really expensive Star Wars ones. And then insisted that it was an adult man and not three small boys wearing one trench coat. <laughs> Police, uh, this is an update, kind of an update from the story last week. Police had to, uh, had to help evacuate 1,500 people after security officials saw a cracked support beam at the Crystal Ballroom. And by cracked support beam, they mean rap concert. <laughs> DJ liked that joke a little bit. Um, police were quick, they were, they were really quick to step in and help out, just realizing the amount of damage that a cracked beam could do the, to the fragile minds of our young white people. So. <laughs> and lastly, you guys, a 21-year-old man in Corvallis, Oregon last week was arrested for drunk driving while wearing a t-shirt that said, drunk as shit. <laughs> this is the first time the phrase, all right, keep your shirt on, has ever been used for evidence. <laughs> It wasn't actually the shirt that gave him away, though. It was the bumper sticker that said, quote, My other car is, I am drunk as fuck right now. <laughs> it's a good way. Uh, and also, my honor student at Davis Middle School is not in my custody because I'm a raging alcoholic. <laughs> it's a sad story, but that's where we're going to That's the monologue, you guys! <laughs> Let's talk about this. It's been, uh... Well, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in the world, right? There's a lot of things uh, to think about. Uh, we had some news stories that some, divided some people. We had some sad things in the end. We have a new writer on the staff. Our news writer on the staff is a comedian named Anthony Lopez, and he's a, yeah, definitely, you're right. He's a, he's a great comedian. He's a really excellent writer. He's helped us out a lot. He's been very funny. Uh, he's also the most opinionated man I've ever met. <laughs> And in a, in a delightful way, it's great. He, but he has, there's nothing that he doesn't have an opinion about. And so we started doing this web series, for those of you who haven't seen it, we did a web series uh, called Strong Opinions with Anthony Lopez. And we just gave him a beer and a minute and just threw topics at him. <laughs> and it was great fun. Uh, you can see it on our website. But we decided uh, that this would be a great opportunity since we have all of you here and we have some interesting stuff going on in the world to do a live version of Strong Opinions with Anthony Lopez. Does that seem fun? Yeah. Yeah. Alpha position. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> you guys saw that I didn't flinch, right? Yeah. <laughs> I okay. So here's what I got. I got a list of some topics that I, with Bree and uh, some of our other writers, we've generated. We're, I'm just gonna pitch some stuff at you. You're comfortable? You settled I'm in? Always ready to be opinionated. <laughs> All right. So some of these are questions, and some of them aren't. Uh, which do you prefer? You guys ready? You ready, sir? 
Which do you prefer, Anthony, as a nickname for Portland, Bridgetown or Stumptown? Bridgetown is clearly the better name. What? What? We cut down a bunch of fucking trees once. La di da. We built bridges, you guys. That is such. We have. I don't know if this is true. A guy told me this once when he was drunk once. But he said that we're called Bridgetown because we have more feet of bridge than any other bridge the city of the world. And that's something to be proud of. Any city can just cut down trees. We built more bridges than France or something. Or not. Uh, yeah. More feet of bridge, you guys. That's awesome. We got all the feet of bridge. And... I have strong memories with a little festival named after that. Oh, that's true. It's the Bridgetown Comedy yeah, Festival. Yeah, Stumptown Comedy Festival. I'm not going to go to There's that. There's a Stumptown Improv Festival. They're competing now. I don't do improv, so... <laughs> All right, what's the... What, okay, new question. What is the best first-person shooter? Sub-question, why isn't it Goldeneye? <laughs> I'm a big fan of Bioshock 2 DLC Manova's Den. <laughs> that's a very good one. But, so... Okay. It's a, it's a very hard thing to say. There's a lot of great first person shoes. I can tell you why it's not Goldeneye. Okay. <laughs> Goldeneye is a great game. But in the same way that, like, when I was 16 and I was only drinking Paps because that's all I knew how to get, I thought Paps was the greatest beer on the planet. <laughs> I was like, oh man, this is the mountaintop beer, piss water, it's delicious. And then I grew up and I discovered, like, sophisticated beers. I was like, oh, it's so much better. But hey, you pin four people around with Paps and Goldeneye and SDTV, it's still a good time. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's it's Half-Life 2. Okay, moving on. All right. Uh, waiting in line for ice cream for an hour. Acceptable, not acceptable? Is, is the Holocaust acceptable? <laughs> Com completely, completely unacceptable. Let me tell you about the first time I ever went to Salt, uh, salt and Straw. That's the big one here. Yeah. First time I ever went there, there was no line. I swear to God, if I was like, hey, it's an ice cream shop, we should go there. So I went in with a friend, we got ice cream, it was delicious. And they're like drug dealers, they give you that first one for free, no line. <laughs> and they get you hooked, and the next thing they want you to do is wait an hour, wait two hours, while they just take breaks and fuck around on their cell phones. <laughs> is that what they're doing? I didn't notice that. <laughs> I don't know, I've never gone in. I don't know what they're doing in there. A, a drug I see guy the told line that one and time. I leave. That's a bullshit opinion. <laughs> Oh. That's a bullshit. Wait, wait, wait oh. a minute. Uh, yeah. Portland's funniest person, Shane Torres. Oh. What is your deal, Shane? What's wrong? You won't wait in line an hour for ice cream, but you'll wait with me two hours to see The Dark Knight for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> You're fucking full of shit, man. Look, like, if I was going into the ice cream place and the guy at the counter was giving me a ledger quality ice cream scoop. <laughs> Yeah, I'd come back for the second time. I'd probably come back for the third time. I saw that movie four times in the theaters. <laughs> yeah, and you shit all over it. Nothing yeah. pleases you. I got a lot of problems with it. It's fun, though. Yeah, he's got a lot of problems with the unrealistic superhero movie. Oh. Okay, 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 gentlemen, settle down for a second. I'm gonna ask a question to both of you now. Uh, how about this? Uh, which, shape, which state should we kick out of the U.S.? You Shane? go first. Uh, Anthony, go first. Okay, here's what I think on this. This is a pitch I've actually pitched to a senator once. <laughs> I say, here's what we do. We dig Disney World out of the ground, move it to another state, and then we just cut Florida off. Well, just pavement. A giant... Imagine if your kids were like, Hey, Dad, what's with that uh, giant poking lot that looks like a penis sticking out of the United States? And I was like, oh, it's better than what used to be there. <laughs> So Florida, but we gotta take Disney World out because that place is fucking magic. Shane, what do you think? I say any state that has another cardinal direction in the state. So North Carolina, South Carolina can go. <laughs> North Dakota, South Dakota. And then we don't what about change the Virginia, name. Virginia, West Virginia. So you would lose Virginia just by association? Yeah, you cut, you cut them both off. Like, you get rid of all six of those. Yeah. <laughs> what about, all right, what about new versus old? Like, we, do we get to keep New York and New Mexico? Have you been to New Mexico? <laughs> Places of shit. I went there one time when I left Texas, that's where I'm from, uh, and I stopped in Las Cruces, which is the first town across the western border of Texas, and in Las Cruces I stopped to get gas, and all I saw at this AM PM was a homeless man drinking paint. So, <laughs> if you want to keep that, fine. <laughs> But also, no. Like, are you shitting me? You want to keep that? All right. 
Which is the best world war? Z. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have so many thoughts. So let's start, because uh, it sounded like when, sound like when Brew was introducing everybody, yeah. uh, based on the applause, it's like 50-50 people who are most excited about you and most excited about Bill. <laughs> and I'm, right? That's exactly what I heard. Right. So, uh, uh, so let's say for the Bill people, why don't you tell us about your, you have your new company called Fulbright Game Company, Fulbright Company, yeah. uh, and your new your game is uh, Gone Home. And for those of you who haven't played Gone Home, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, uh, I used to work, you were, I think it was mentioned. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's total it's coincidence. It's coincidence that Anthony said uh, that your work was his favorite thing. He mentioned the Bioshock series. Yeah. So I was a designer on the Bioshock series for uh, a number of years. And then uh, me and a couple of people that I used to work with uh, on those games, we quit and uh, moved to Portland. and started our own very small independent game studio. Um, and they did very... Portland, we, uh, like a band. We all moved into a house together and our studio was in the basement. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, we made a, a game called Gone Home, uh, which is like, it basically is a very small game. You explore a house and you guys kind of get to go through this family's stuff uh, to find out who they are, what happened to them, what their story is. Yeah, I don't know if there's an official genre for it. I would have called it like first person cat burglar. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, we, we tried to get a little further away from the home invasion angle. Uh, <laughs> so the character you're playing lives there, but I don't live there. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm just looking at all these people's stuff. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, we were kind of trying to walk that line, because in the game, in the fiction, you play the like, college-age daughter of the family who's coming home after being away for a year. So it's like, and you, you, you think your family's going to be there, but nobody's there. So it's like, where did everybody go? There's a mystery. I need to find out what happened. So you kind of have permission to go through all the shit, right. uh, <laughs> but you, in the chair, right. uh, yeah, just get to, you know, have that experience. Yeah, and what I, what I found, I don't know if this is common when you were like testing it out, but when I, when I first started, you, so you could just pick stuff up and look at it and examine it, and yeah. it's like beautifully run, and everything's incredibly uh, beautiful, including like uh, uh, all of these handwritten notes, yeah. and, and, all, and I, when I first started playing, I was very careful. <laughs> and I picked it up, and then I put it back where it belonged, and I turned the lights off when I left, and, and I closed the door, and by the end I was like, screw it, it's not my house, and I was like throwing the Christmas duck, and then I'm just running around and throwing stuff. Is that, is that a common thing with the way people play it? Do people like treat it like it's a real house when they first start playing? Um, well, like, terrible people act the way that you did. <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning or at the end? At the beginning or the end? It really depends. Uh, so <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a Rorschach test. You, you, you had the Alex Falcone version of going, going through this, this family's home and eventually deciding, fuck it, <laughs> which is fine. So when you're, when you're writing this, the thing, it, it develops, it does develop like in, an, in a very clever way the story about what's, what's happened to her family. Yeah. Do you think of yourself as a storyteller or as a, a game designer first, or do those both have to just live in your brain at the same time? Uh, I mean, I think the thing that is probably the most interesting about like writing for a game is that really the design and the writing have to develop together. You know, because I think that it's the kind of thing where if you just were to extract just the story out of this game, just read through it, you know, it's, a, it's, very, it's kind of like a very simple short story, but the reason that you care about it, I think, is because you're finding it right. through the interactivity, right? Like you're discovering it yourself. I think there's a certain level of engagement you have. Right, so you can't, so you, if you, you can't think of it in terms of just the story, but you also can't think of the game without the story. Right, yeah, yeah. So you have to be thinking of those both at the same time? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we started from certain influences, you know, like, the, so, uh, you, you played the game. Thank you for playing. Um, the, the game takes place in the 90s, uh, uh -huh. and we made it in Portland, and I don't know, it, it's, yeah. it's a little bit, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a thing. One of the things she finds is she finds a lot of tapes. <laughs> Uh, a yeah, lot of cassette tapes. tapes. Cassette tapes with uh, with incredible bands. I really, like this. It sounded like great '90s uh, uh, Riot Girl yeah. music. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Yeah, we had um, some yeah Pacific Northwest bands. We had Bratmobile and Heaven to Betsy in the band. Heaven to Betsy was Corn Tucker's first band. We then was singer and Slater. Yeah, band. yeah. Um, which was awesome, right? Because it's like we wanted to have this feeling of 
authenticity. You know, like it's not just stuff we made up, but there's actually music that you might have listened to when you were a teenager that you find. Yeah. So it, this seems like a very like from going from uh, shooting people <laughs> to this game where you're discovering the, I mean, to this love story about sure. uh, uh, a young woman. Was this something like all, were you on Bioshock? Were you the one who was always pitching like, what if what if they met somebody perfect and fell in love? <laughs> Couldn't we just have it be nice? Yeah. What if, <laughs> what if everything worked out for everybody? <laughs> uh, yes. You should have been in some of those meetings. No, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where, like, I think that, you know, in a game like Bioshock, the, the thing that's really interesting about it is that it takes place in this kind of dystopian society, right? Like, the danger is part of the story, part of the experience. And I think the flip side of that is when there's this expectation that you are going to be shooting let's say hundreds of people, uh, over the course of the game. Um, the way I play the game, I try not to hurt anybody. It's a Rorschach <laughs> test, Steve. <laughs> How'd that work out for you? <laughs> uh, but, you know, like, when, when you know that's how, like, there's going to be a lot of, you know, violence and stuff in the game, you can't tell certain stories, right? Like, right. You, you can't just kind of talk about a family and what they've gone through. So, it was... Uh, a, a, it was kind of uh, liberating to be able to say, like, you know, we don't have to put in a bunch of gunplay or like crazy puzzles or anything. We can just right. talk about these people in a game. So it, I don't know. It was it was good. And also, so you went from a big company though, mm -hmm. being like a, a cog in a large in a large company, a large machine, to this small company that is. I, I believe the credits was like it was like five people and twelve cats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we thanked our cats at the end. You have to. <laughs> you thanked more cats than people. <laughs> There were there were eighteen cats in the credits. Did they move into the house too? Not not all of them. Uh, Some of them worked remotely. <laughs> it's very progressive of you. Did uh, so so what's it like working in that small company? Like do you do you love that small? I mean, you, you presumably you couldn't have known this was going to be as successful as it was because it's been a huge hit. You won a ton of awards. Really, you when you were first building this, like when you were first starting your first demo tape as a band, like you don't you don't know if it's going to go. Right? Like, how right. was that as a small band, not knowing where it's going to go, versus the security of, like, this company's going to keep paying me no matter what happens? I, I mean, I think that part of it is you know that you can, take a, you can take a chance, and you can be like, we're going to quit our jobs, and we're going to try and do this thing, and if we totally face plant, and we don't ship it, or we put it out, and nobody cares, or whatever, it's like, all right, you just wasted a bunch of your, you know, yeah. savings, but you can get another job. But, you know, you can, right? Like, it's, it's not like you're, if you, if you try something and mess up, that you're done forever, right? right. Uh, I mean, and like we moved back here and it's cheap, so my plan, uh, if this game failed, I was like, let's see if Sizzle Pie like, wants somebody to serve some pizzas. <laughs> I can pay, like, you, I, I know people pay their rent here. They just do, yeah. like, you know, uh, I think it's only going to be cheap for another like three months, though, guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also, some people don't pay their taxes, so that's how they make it work. I don't know what you're talking about. How dare you? <laughs> So, so I mean, like on the one hand, it's it's, it's scary or whatever in, in a way, but on the other hand, I don't know. We we just we we had a, mostly we wanted to make a game that we would think was good, yeah. and so we were like, okay, we when we were finishing up, we were like, all right, we're happy with this. this is, I think it's pretty good, you know. And hopefully enough people will agree that they'll actually like pay enough that we can keep doing this thing. And so it's worked out that way, right? It has. And now that now that all this has happened, you've won these awards and it's been so successful. Do you have to blow up this company and go start a one-person two-cat company? <laughs> <laughs> Scaled down. Once yeah, yeah. You more. gotta keep. You gotta keep going I'm smaller. Not, and so, let's what's do, your solo well, project well, let's, like? Let's do that thought experiment. I do that. <laughs> It works out great. Uh huh. What's the? <laughs> I, I you have to lose one of the cats. <laughs> it's the only option. I'll find a cat that'll work for share. <laughs> it would just it would be too heartbreaking to have to lay off a cat. I don't think I could do it. Uh, so one of the things about this game is that it did. It seems like if you go to Steam and you read through some of the comments, there are some people who are upset that there's not more gunplay in it. Yeah, like uh, like almost none. Okay, there's none. <laughs> Yeah, there's none, none, none gunplay, uh, and you can't. I mean, you can't even break their mugs. Not that I tried. <laughs> but no matter how, no matter how high in the house you get and throw the mug, it'll never break. You were just tossing shit down the stairs. And eventually, Rorschach I want to. test. I left the freezer open. The milk is in the microwave. It's chaos. <laughs> 
you did give a lot of like freedom for yeah. someone to mess around. And then your parents are going to come home and they're going to be like, what is wrong with our daughter? I, it's like a crazy man was controlling her. <laughs> Okay, well, don't, and, and don't act like I'm the first crazy man to play this game, because there is a letter where her sister talks about a sexual encounter, mm -hmm. and you don't get to read all of it. Yep. It disappears, and no matter how many times, not that I tried, no matter how many times you click on it, you don't get to see the full details. Of and even if you quit and come back in, it won't let you read it. I'm not saying I tried, says <laughs> Alex Falk. I know, I, no, I, at that point I had some stuff to break, so I didn't keep playing, but... If I screenshotted that, would there have been the full letter? Is yeah, the whole... yeah, that, that's on the internet. Oh, you can I Google just, it. I, that's, that would be that would be creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you got some, you got some. There was some feedback about that, about like, but now that you're being, now that you're being so punk rock about your career, <laughs> yeah. Like, do, do you have to read comments like that that you probably would have been able to ignore? No, you don't have to read. You, you do not have to read the comments on the <laughs> internet. <laughs> No one's gonna make you. Uh, some of it you can't avoid. Like when you like r when you get comments on the company blog, you get right. an email about it, right? But sure. I mean, it, for the most part, the interesting thing is if you don't seek out most like negative comments, you won't see them because most people are not very confrontational about that stuff. It's the rare internet person who will actually like track you down and tell you right. to your internet face that they hate what you made. Mostly that's like off in the corner somewhere, so it's not that hard to avoid. Yeah, and, and do you, now that you've got this done, it's been a huge success, obviously you have to release a second one where I can buy more things with coins and <laughs> some, complete some, some surveys. Purchases. Yeah, yeah, obviously that's the next move, right? What? You, yeah, it's like you're reading through, oh, you're, you feel very tired. <laughs> do you want to buy? You can either play for eight more hours or if you complete this survey, <laughs> you can skip to the attic. Right, us a five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is it, I mean, do you have that kind of pressure too? Because you're building it. This is the game's going. The gaming's going in some different directions. That's one of them, certainly. <laughs> uh, like, do you, well, do you feel pressure to do that? Do you feel pressure to do uh, the same thing? Are you going to go make a game that's just gunplay and nothing else? <laughs> like, what? What's the most punk rock thing to do next? Well, those are. That's a lot of different questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so what what the, is the summary? Most punk rock thing to do next is like. That is a different question than what am I going to do next. Okay, great, I, I, great. I'm afraid. I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not punk rock enough to do whatever the most punk rock possible thing would be. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, my job is to sit in front of a computer all day. <laughs> the least punk rock thing you can do. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a less punk rock thing, but I can't think of it at the moment. <laughs> there's a reason do your you taxes, think. that's all you've got, yeah. nothing else. Um, no, I, I mean, the, the thing is, yeah, like, we, we were a very small, you know, team. Made a very small game. It's done pretty well. The nice thing is, it just it gives us the freedom to like do our next thing without saying like we gotta get something out there in six months or we're gonna go broke or like we have to like. That's the kind of thing when you're working for like a big company. When you're working for like a publicly traded company, right. you're gonna end up doing the direct sequel because the stockholders know that's the most sure bet to get good return on investment. Or if whatever. you if you sold Gun Next Door, I would buy it. <laughs> I'm curious what their neighbors are up to. <laughs> Which, I'll mark that down. I'll take that on advisement. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the nice thing is, yeah, we, there's, there's nobody that's saying, here's the next thing you have to do. So we're basically going to say we, we want to take Gone Home as a, as a base, you know, like as kind of the core of, of, of the experience we want to build, and then just kind of expand out from there and see what, like, the one interesting thing we can add to it is. But not go crazy. Not make something totally different or, like, hire 100 people or whatever, you know. Right. It's like... Just take the next step. And, uh, and then you'll put it to the vote and see what the cats say, and then you'll move on <laughs> with whatever's next. We do require consensus from all 16 cats. <laughs> you do, and, and you did just get, uh, you just started uh, announcing your porting to consoles. Yeah, we're going to so. on 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 your, your home video game consoles. Because, yeah, this is a PC-only game. Yeah. It's a lot easier to just put a game on a computer uh, when you're, like, four people. Right. Uh, but, yeah, we're going we're gonna to put it on Xboxes and Playstations and stuff. So check that out, and then yeah. look for Gone Next Door uh, in a couple years. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Gaynor. Thank you so much for being here, Steve! All right, uh, our next guest, you met him a few minutes ago, uh, but now he's going to be in his, if not heckling, he's going to be in his official capacity as the funniest person in Portland winner. Please welcome out, ladies and gentlemen, comedian Shane Torres!
Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate it. Uh, one person, thank you. Uh, off to a roaring start. I got this friend and he's got all these strong opinions. I'm kidding. Uh, I, the cook made me mashed potatoes after I disagreed about mashed potatoes. So this show is just playing tons of benefits or whatever. Uh, strike two. Uh, uh, you guys can probably tell this by looking at me, but I have been fired a lot in my life. So I'm 31 years old and I look like a Native American meatloaf impersonator. The last time I got fired, I got fired because I, I got a bad Yelp review. And all the Yelp review said was, Shane sucks butthole. <laughs> and that's it. And my boss, she didn't say anything. She just printed it off and slid it across the desk. And she just goes, hmm. <laughs> and it seemed mildly suggestive. So I was like, are you asking? And... <laughs> Then she fucking fired me. Uh, but you know, like, I didn't do that awesome you can't fire me, I quit move that you see some people do when they get fired, which is like the coolest thing ever. Uh, but I did see a guy quit his job the best way ever one time. I was working at a restaurant in Fort Worth, Texas called Good Eats Grill. So that'll let you know the clientele that was coming in. And at one point, the manager, Pat, and the waiter, Richard, got in a huge argument in front of all the customers until finally Pat just goes, all right, Richard, get the fuck out, you're fucking fired. And Richard just yelled back without missing a beat, I don't need this goddamn job, I sell coke. <laughs> Which is the coolest way ever to quit your job, like, fuck your reference, I'm in the dope game now. Ah! <laughs> Richard gonna be all right. Uh, he wasn't though, he got shot. Uh, uh, you guys were talking about internet comments earlier. Uh, I have read them. <laughs> and those people are fucking animals. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. I uploaded a set, right? Uh, and I went to sleep. I uploaded it onto YouTube. It's a video sharing website. And, and, uh, 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 you've heard of it. Uh, and then uh, uh, I went to sleep and the next morning my then girlfriend uh, and that's funny, yeah. Uh, <laughs> surprise, she left. <laughs> she didn't want to sleep with someone who has night terrors. Uh, <laughs> you guys ever think that love is a weapon you can only use to commit suicide? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it got weird. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I, uh, but this was on my birthday, and the next morning, no, shut up! I got, got a, it's, it's a time thing. I'm sorry, you seem nice. Uh, but uh, the next morning, we went to breakfast for my birthday, and uh, this was like very early on in our relationship. And then we went through a walk for a walk through the park, and then we just drove around and listened to Sam Cooke songs. Uh, that was her favorite. And then she kissed me and she said, I love you. And that was the first time she ever said it. So I said it back, because you have to. And uh, you figure somebody would have found a way out of that by now, like, back on ya, or whatever. Like, hey, do so you want to get ribs? Or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I did, I, I did love her. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know. And, uh, I drop her off at work, uh, and I go home, and I'm like, oh, you should check out your set and see how it's doing on YouTube, that video sharing website. And uh, I look at it, about 50 views, uh, pretty standard for me. And uh, then I read the comments section, and it was all the meanest shit you could ever imagine. Every comment, none of it even had anything to do with my comedy. They were all just like, you're a fuck mouth, and that's it. <laughs> And here's the thing, I wanted to stick up for myself, but I wasn't about to do it for my own YouTube profile. So I made up a fake YouTube profile. And I uh, watched the set like seven times, you know, to throw them off the scent a little bit. 
And then I wrote, this guy's hilarious. <laughs> Two minutes later, somebody wrote back, you're a fuck mouth too. <laughs> I'm gonna finish with a joke. I, uh, I was in the post office the other day, and I was in line, there like eight or nine of us in line. And this guy walked in, and he saw the line. I swear to God, this is exactly what he did. He just goes, uh, and then this. Excuse me, everyone. I just need to mail something. <laughs> And everybody in line was like, are you an only child? Like, you're the most homeschooled person ever, aren't you? Like, I'm just gonna be like, well, the rest of us are just waiting for ribs, so go right ahead. Thank you guys very much. Have a great day. Have a seat, buddy. Well, welcome. Thanks Thank for you. being here, Shane. Thanks for having me back. Uh, yeah, this is your... Are, you're, our, you're our first return guest. You're yeah. the person who's been on Late Night Action the most. Yeah. <laughs> you, were on, you were on back in season one. Wow. Wow. Uh, uh, so, and you know quite what, an honor. You know what's great? Uh, when you, in season one, you were not Portland's funniest person. Yeah. <laughs> That's and now true. you are. Yeah, uh, it depends on who you ask. I well, guess. so you so you won the contest with that illustrious name last year. How has yeah. it been living in that pressure, being announced that way every time? <laughs> it's it's like and the best part about it. Like you, you know, you did it, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm I the I'm the I left so many bodies and comedians <laughs> in my wake. I really didn't go. Uh, just I, see right out there. You just go out there and crush. Yeah. Uh, it's. I'll be honest, it fucking sucks. Uh, in some way, it, the best part about it is not having to do the contest again. Well, that's true, uh, yeah. Uh, but, Are you uh, going to host it this year? What? Are you going to host it this year? I am going to host it. Uh, they're making me. Uh, uh. <laughs> they're not made, but it's fine. But yeah, like the worst part is like everybody says, now Portland's funniest person. Like, like if you were in a comedy club and they say Portland's funniest person, it's kind of like the same yeah. equivalent of somebody saying like, oh my God, my husband's choking, I need a doctor. And everyone, but instead there's just a spotlight shining on you, you have no anonymity. Like, I don't have any room to fail. No. Like, they expect I, me to I, be good. I Credits understand. make people yeah. want you to be good. Yeah. Or if they're just like, here's Steve Pineapple from Sarasota, like, <laughs> and then I come out and kill. Like, He's the, hilarious. Steve yeah, Pineapple? Oh my fucking God. Fucking funny guy. <laughs> I have basically the same problem. A lot of times I get introduced as one of the top 20 funniest people in Portland, but not the top 10. So, I have a lot, because of the contest, I have a lot of work to follow. Too. I would say that's accurate. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> that's not how this works. Why not? That's usually how dialogues work. Let's get off script, buddy. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Mix it up. Guys. Why is this show called Late Night Action if it starts at 9 o'clock? <laughs> it's like, oh, later we're going to go home and watch An Inconvenient Truth. A wild weekend for us. Listen, not everybody has your comedian rock and roll lifestyle. Some of us have got to work. It's not about what time the show starts. We're going to end at 3. Oh, I mean, it's cool. a long oh, yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really like a, like a, a post-happy hour to pancakes. So pre Yeah. yeah. Buckle up, you guys. You know those yeah. parties that are like, this party ends at question mark? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody's here is like, oh, we gotta stay till three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, they're lucky. They're prepared. They all packed a bag. They're yeah. ready yeah. to go. They know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and obviously, you're gonna interrupt every other bit we try to do. <laughs> so it's gonna be a lot of that same joke. <laughs> <laughs> so you are leaving for New York. That's true. Oh, sorry. We're, uh, we're, ma we're breaking news here on Late Night Action. You guys uh, must love me so much that you've never seen me before. <laughs> I, I, you know, said, you'd be tired of these jokes in six months, I swear to God. Well, so so are you are you nervous? Are you excited? Was it something we said? What's yeah, I think I'm just going to show up and make it. Like, <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I don't think it, I don't think it's hard at all. You know, like yeah. anybody who really tries in show business has never failed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm she's solid. I'm so petrified. Really? It's absurd. Yeah, like it's like it's just like I'm prepping myself right now because uh, New York's a very expensive place, yeah. uh, and I'm sleeping in my friend's living room. 
Uh, and I'm just like, oh, this will be like, you know, your Rocky montage training moment for when you get to New York. I don't, I don't know how much of the training montage in Rocky was spent sleeping. <laughs> That's not the most impressive thing he did. That's true. This is a slightly adverse condition to sleep in. It depends on which Rocky you're talking about, too. Either way, you've got your, uh, your hooded sweatshirt and game down. It's true. <laughs> Thank you, man. I also boxed. If he naps, he naps. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Nice one, Dolph. Uh, Rocky deep cuts. Uh, <laughs> so, you're, are, you, are you scared for the financial part, or are you scared for like doing comedy? Like, are, do you, like, does does Portland's funniest person credit follow you to New York, or is that not impressive? Uh, it has actually. Really? It's so funny. I was doing this really popular independent show uh, last time I was in New York called Cabin, which is like this crazy room. It's like. It's, it holds like 30 people, maybe, right. in this room. But, crazy? But, but it's like, they're nuts. They go crazy. And then, like, there's just, like, comics that are, like... Like, Louis C.K. will stop by, like, once a month, and right. Bill Burr will be there right after him. And when I went in there, they were just like, Hey, everybody, here's two people you've seen on Saturday Night Live. It was fucking Jay Farrow and Seth Meyers went up right before me. And then they brought me up, and they're like, And now, Portland's funniest person. <laughs> You know, the funniest guy in a city, one-twelfth the size of yours. They probably, they, they probably wondered if you meant Portland, Maine. That's the... Yeah. <laughs> That's a tough market to break into. <laughs> I could be top ten in Maine. You think I, I, think I could do that? You yeah. had all those fishing jokes. <laughs> uh, so... So, uh, a couple things we can still enjoy from you before you take off. Uh, talk to us about your radio show. Ah, uh, yeah, I have a, a radio show on X-Ray FM. Uh, I think it's 90.7. I don't know. You uh, think? Yeah, I really don't know. Uh, the show is good, though. Uh, the, the first one, uh, we got kicked off the air like 20 minutes in. Yeah, because, you, you got almost fired your first show. Yeah, which is impressive, even for me. Uh, because... Uh, and like basically the concept of the show is called Help Wanted and I interview like local artists, creative types, comedians, actors, musicians about the terrible day jobs they've had to endure to get to where they want in their lives. Yeah. So there's always really funny and there's somebody's always got a great story about having a psycho customer or working in the coffee shops. So it's a pretty relatable idea for everyone in this city. Yeah. Because all of you are doing something else besides what you're doing. You know? Right. Steve's working at a pizza place. It's Steve, tough. Steve's doing fine. Uh, <laughs> Steve has affected as many people as I have tonight, and he also has a video game. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, 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 uh, what, when is that? When is the radio show on? Oh, uh, it's on Tuesdays from 11 in the morning till 12 in the afternoon. It's an hour. Uh, I know that was weird. You I mean while everybody's that. at their day jobs? Yeah. This is Portland. Nobody's at their fucking day job. Uh, but that's but some people, yeah. Maybe they let you listen to the radio at work, and you need a new kind of like cool, hip, younger Mark Marin type to lead you through your day. Uh, and maybe it's we both have body image issues. His are just the good kind. Uh, be skinny. I, I'm not. We can also uh, we can also see. Uh, Tell us about your, do you have any more uh, funny over everything? Oh yeah, yeah. I, have, I, I book a show with a brilliant comedian named Sean Jordan uh, and uh, Ian Carmel, who I'm sure everyone in this room knows. Ooh. Yes. Uh, here's the thing, anytime I get mentioned in any kind of press article, he, I always get mentioned as Ian Carmel's former roommate. Uh, so now when I'm plugging myself, I say his name too. Because yeah. it garners more attention. But uh, we book it at the Hollywood Theater and the goal of the show is to bring comics that you may or may not have heard of that are not necessarily the biggest draw in the world. Bring you great quality comics at an affordable price that's like, it's like 10 bucks to see somebody you're going to see with their own sitcom in a year or two. Like, like, I mean, yeah, that's, what, that's what I'm cash. doing right now yeah. for you. You think so? I'm allowing these people for $10 to come in and see someone who's going to be on a sitcom in a couple years. I. Yeah. What, 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 if you were going to pitch me in a vehicle for a sitcom, I'm looking for ideas. Well, ask you, well, uh, well, maybe we'll ask Bill. Like this lumberjack hurt his back and he's just <laughs> 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 
snorted stand-up comedy. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. You just you just did it. Uh, we can also we can also uh, get updates on all of this on, on you're on Twitter at Syrup Mountain. Syrup Mountain on Twitter uh, at Syrup Mountain. You guys, that's there's another Shane Torres who took it the Shane Torres, and he's also a stand-up. Uh, yeah, but he's also a mixed martial artist. Uh, <laughs> So all of his tweets are like, I'm a brilliant satirist, like Mark Twain, only better. And then also, I fucked that fool up tonight. Like, it's just like... <laughs> so you took uh, Syrup Mountain, which was not claimed. No, uh, my friend, yeah, I tried to be Night Tiger. Uh, some weird German guy owned that. Uh, <laughs> And then I tried to get ShaneTorres.com, yeah. but that's a Remax realtor in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> and then Shane Torres Comedy is owned by the my boxer. Like, yeah. And then so I have a Shane is a comedian question mark dot com. No. <laughs> really? With the question mark? We're not with a question, with the word question mark, because you can't put in punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Shane Torres, everybody. Thank you guys. for Mission Hill and for Portland, among other things. Please welcome Mr. Bill Oakley! You've done an incredible number of things. You've done a million different things, uh, but it, we would be remiss if we didn't start with The Simpsons and end with The Simpsons and do The Simpsons in the middle, right? That's what you're talking about? Yes. Uh, you, so you, you not only, well, let's start here. There's somebody, that somebody, uh, somebody on the Mercury wanted me to ask. First of all, so you were the showrunner for seven and eight? <clears throat> That's right. Uh, so I know what that means, obviously. But for people who don't know what that means, uh, well, tell, tell us what, show, what you were doing as the showrunner of, of The Simpsons. Uh, the showrunner is like the director of a movie, sort of like a, a movie that's written and directed and produced by one person. That's kind of what the showrunner of a TV show is, um, where, especially in an animated show, you make every decision about everything. That's really what it is. You decide what episodes are going to be done. That's not bragging at all. Who's going to be writing uh, Okay. <laughs> uh, who's going to be writing them? You direct the actors, you direct the sound editors, you direct the animators, and... Um, you know, it's a very stressful job, which is why, at, that, at least at that point, people were only doing it for two years at a time. Yeah. Well, so, do you, so you, you came up through the writing program, so do you, by that, when you'd written for a few years on the season, they're like, well, this guy seems like he's ready to direct well, that, and it was sort of like a, a seniority thing, and fortunately, the person right in front of us was Conan O'Brien, so he got hired off to do a talk show, and then we were, like, sitting pretty for the promotion to run Right. The show. <laughs> well, and so you, this, this, the seasons that you that you uh, were doing everything for are like, that is, this is like the, the golden age. This is the time that people who are really in Simpsons discuss as, this is the best part of the show. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I know you've got, on, on your resume you have The Simpsons, but you also have that, like not only The Simpsons, but you beat other The Simpsons when you're writing. Uh, is that is that something that when you're, when, you're, when you're getting, when you sit down to meet with somebody to pitch a new show, do you mention that? Do you get to bring that up? Uh, do, you, do you mention that to your, your friends every time you're out hanging out? I have to say it's tragic that people, the average person in Hollywood is not nearly as familiar with The Simpsons as you are. <laughs> uh, they have, tragic, they have no idea um, what seasons were the good ones or whatever, and which ones were regarded by fans and so and so. They, they are aware that it made a lot of money though, so that's, right. you, can, you can sometimes get some mileage out of that. Right, so you so you you wrote wrote for them for a bunch of years. You you did the the, the showrunner. You were like you've done all of the things there, and then you decided to go be involved in every other show over the next like fifteen years. What do you it, you've done a million things? What are you what are you working on right now? What's the thing that's like the like what's you're filling your days with? <clears throat> well, uh, I actually most of the time I write pilots, and like uh, as you probably know about movies, there's like a thousand screenplays written that go into a file cabinet that are never seen. Right, I'm the TV equivalent of that. I write TV. You're filling up file cabinets yeah, well, for somebody. Say, you know, it's hard drives now. You're right. Uh, but we, uh, I write pilots, and I have uh, several pilots that are going right now. The actual thing that uh, of mine that's going to be on the air uh, next is there's a show called Trip Tank on Comedy Central uh, that just started a few weeks ago. That is a um, kind of like Adult Swim boiled down into one half hour. It's all sorts of crazy animation, and they solicited a lot of different people, like um, you know Bob Odenkirk and Larry David, people like that, to do like little shorts. And I have one that I'm very proud of that starts in about two weeks. And what's it about? It is about a team of uh, schoolgirl assassins from Tokyo who are, sent, <laughs> who are sent to Texas 
by the Yakuza to take over the drug trade there. Uh, and it's called uh, Flower Team Kill Team Go. And it's, it's sort of a parody of Japanese anime, and I'm very proud of the way it came out. Um, and that'll be on uh, in yeah, six, episodes 6, 7, and 8 of Trip Tank. So if you're doing, if you're mostly producing pilots, like, th that seems emotionally much more trying than writing a continued saga. That you have to like start and get really invested in characters and then set it down and then get that's, invested in That's right, it. yes. It's terrible. I mean, well, okay. I, well, to begin this, I knew you were going to ask a question like this, so I prepared a quote. Um, and Dorothy Parker once said, um, I hate writing, but I love having written. Uh, sure, that I That describes me. Lot. I really, yeah. really hate writing. I hate it. But right. I have to do it all the time. Uh, for a living and yes, be great at it. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, debatably, but I have to do, um, I have to keep writing stuff, and it's, I don't know, writing is hard, man. Like, people who are like, oh, I can just sit down and type, and, but that, I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> how, how can you possibly do that? I mean, every, like, also, I think it's much worse in the age of perpetual distraction. Yeah. Um, and I literally have to turn off the phone, turn off the cell phone, turn off the house phone, and use one of those programs that keeps the internet locked out. Right, that doesn't let you computer. go on Twitter. Yeah, or it doesn't let you do anything. And right. you it's also irreversible. You can't restart the computer or whatever. And so I have to do that. And then I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to go do the laundry or whatever. And right. things like that. So I finally, eventually, finally, the panic sets in and I start writing. But it is, I, I know, it's hard. And, like, I don't like... Making up stuff from scratch, like you're, you're exactly right. Working on the Sony of the Simpsons, it, there was a whole universe already created, and we knew the grammar of the characters, and you knew, you know, Millhouse would say stuff like this and whatever. Right. It, that's much easier than writing a pilot where you have to create the whole universe from scratch right. every single time. And you also have to, like, when you start the next pilot, you have to lose all of that stuff that you got really invested in for those previous people. You have to, like, you liked these characters. And then yes, you have to I had a pilot them. that I worked for a year. This is what happens constantly in TV development and movies and so forth. Uh, I had a pilot that I worked on for a year and a half for Comedy Central with, actually with some people that might even be in this room, that was kind of like the Portland, um, more like a workaholics kind of show, but for Portland with a okay. kind of scene uh -huh. that I wanted some, maybe even, even Ian Carmel to appear in. Okay, so sure. And then yeah. you get a call and it, suddenly it's dead. Bam. And then you're just like, uh, oh, I didn't really expect that, but like, you got to move on to the next thing and that's the way it works. <sighs> was, that, was that a siren or like the loudest siren? Yeah. Or what just happened? <laughs> Either way, it's appropriate. So, uh, so what is the thing? If you if the writing uh, stresses you out so much, and this emotional part, I love of it when it's really finished, like, though. That's like said, I love it when it's done, and I'm like, oh my god, and I read it over and over, and I'm like, oh look at that, man, that's really funny. Oh, I was like thinking, man, I'm so talented, and then I love, I love that, I love that part. But like the part of like, oh, the part of and the internet's it. back. It's a great yeah, time. Oh, I know, man, that's joy every day when that happens. But so that's and what was the question again? So, I didn't get to it yet. Right. You, you, <laughs> that's great. I was gonna ask like, so what is the what's the dream that like if there was a dream job for you, would it be not writing pilots? Obviously, getting one picked up and spending all your time in that. Would yes, be and that's it, what but. I want to do. That's the thing is, and I, it's, I think this goes back to what the question you may have in mind was the Simps working at the Simpsons uh, spoils you for, uh, since I, you gave me a preview of the question, I did. I'm yes, jumping right. ahead, it's, Yeah, spoils you for other things because it's a unique environment where there's absolutely no interference from anyone else. Um, back when the days when the show was first invented, James L. Brooks was able to negotiate this astounding deal with Fox that like they couldn't have any input, they weren't allowed to, they didn't get the scripts, they couldn't come to the table readings, we'd deliver a tape and they would broadcast it. And like, that's amazing. You never get that kind of deal. You anywhere. ruined it for every other TV show. Yeah. No one's gonna get away with that so ever again. So after working there and having that, yeah. and being in charge of, also when we were running the show, Jim Brooks was directing his movies and he wasn't there and, and, and Matt was not really there. So it was like, we were making all the decisions. And after that, it's hard to go back to the other way of doing things. Where you're like asking Fox's permission to make a joke. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, or even lesser networks. <laughs> Less money to spend. <laughs> So, when Fox says no, you understand, but when the CW right. is not, doesn't oh, like a joke. Yes. So they, uh... So, uh... More interesting that's, size that's the audience. the president of CW is yeah. here. He did say... The goal, and ultimately the goal, would be to have a show like that, that I could do the way I wanted. Right. From, from Portland, ideally, something of that nature. Well, so, okay, so tell me of, of the pilots that have been uh, pushed into the cabinet and closed. What's, what's, what's your favorite thing that you, that you don't get to make it to TV now? The Portland one, so, like, what's, what's, what's something else in your file? Can you tell us? Is that allowed? I had a show, uh, my partner and I had a show that was on the schedule on NBC between 30 Rock and The Office. When the president of NBC got fired, 
uh, that day, and it was uh, it was one of his favorite projects, and it was and it was tragic. <laughs> but you know, what was the show like? What was it? It was called Business Class, and it was a single camera comedy that was kind of like a Thirty Rock type show about two guys who worked uh, effectively worked for Coke, uh, traveling around the country to different places, uh -huh. trying to beat the lady who worked for Pepsi. Uh, to these, to these uh, sales things, and it was yeah. all just about like the hardship of sales and stuff, and it was really funny. But live action, like, live action, live action, and it had a narr The thing is, that the killed it. It had a narrator, and like at that point, oh. like the whole idea of a narrator on TV shows was so hated by network executives right. that they sh made us strip it out, and then the, the guy who replaced. Kevin Riley uh, made us strip it out and re-edit it, and then killed it in like two in the whole two-week process. It was a nightmare, but that kind of thing. Also, ultimately, it would have been killed by the writer's strike anyway. So it, <laughs> that's how you be, that's how you're zen about that kind of thing. Uh, so, so I want to ask one other thing. I know you were, you've worked on some movie pitches as well. Uh, the last time I saw you, we were talking. It was right before Christmas, and I was talking about my obsession with Krampus, the Christmas demon, uh, which is uh, just one of my favorite stories in the world. And you told me that you had worked on a movie about Krampus, and I wondered if you wouldn't tell us a little bit about that okay. right now. I want to give you the ending in advance. It's the same ending that you just heard with uh, the NBC show. Well, it's not the development part. Talk to me about the idea of the movie and, okay. the, and the plot of the movie. This is one of my favorite, uh, this is, again, all this stuff I'm talking about, at least in uh, the old days I was wrote, wrote with my partner, Josh Weinstein. Right. This was one of my fa our favorite things ever, and it was so, it had such a glorious, successful, life until again it was murder <laughs> um it was this it was, it was ruprecht you know the ruprecht is the other version of krampus right right nick ruprecht are you, you so familiar with the story yeah you guys Maybe know you fill them in on the, the christmas demons <laughs> there are okay. uh it, so it's like there's like uh the anti-santa in some countries usually in like the hill parts of germany but there's like there's the evil so if you're good santa brings you gifts and if you're bad Krampus murders you and takes you to hell. Or will beat you with a stick. Yeah, or beat you with a stick. Yeah, it varies uh, in different areas. Uh, but there's like, a lot of places have this, like, the yang to Santa's yin. And it's, the, it's just my favorite part of folklore. And that we have decided to do Christmas without a, a, a Krampus. We just decide Santa's yes, good that's, enough. Well, that was pretty much the premise of the movie. Was that, that Ruprecht was the version. And imagine he was like Jack Black. Uh, that, that he and, <laughs> awesome. he and Santa were partners. Uh, for hundreds of years, right. and Santa would always he'd reward the good kids, and Ruprecht would, you know, abuse the bad kids. Right. And so, but all, but what happened in our movie was that Ruprecht got left behind, like at the South Pole, or for, he was frozen for a hundred years, and sure. he came back, and he's like, "What the hell happened here? Like, you get a present no matter how good or bad you were." <laughs> right. And he couldn't believe it. And he's furious. The, it was based on Lennon and McCartney, like uh, Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> McCartney, like the soft, you know, like the soft kind of easygoing guy, Santa, who's sure. like, oh, they're children, give them presents. And Lennon was like, they've been, they, but they, they, and it was all, just, he was infuriated by the way Santa had let things slide, and Santa was like, oh, well, it, you know, it's Christmas time, and Ruprecht couldn't, um, he finally just, like, he basically just took, knocked Santa out. He took over Christmas and yeah. made it like the Christmas, like the vengeful Christmas. Um, and so, I love this idea so yeah, much. It was really funny, and in fact, it was one of those rare things where, like, in Hollywood, you get, there's a script coverage written by the script, you know, by script readers and stuff. Uh -huh. This actually got great coverage, and people were like, "Oh my God, this never happens." And then they, somebody decided, "Oh, you know what? We can take the elements of the story and we can put them into Santa Claus Three, and that is what happened." And then uh, we never received any credit or money for that, and then they did that. So, but these are sad. I don't worry, I'm bumming everybody out with we're these sad stories on Hollywood. I, I, I mean, talk about something fun and, and nice, Alex. Please. Well. <laughs> I want to dwell on that for just one more second. Uh, not the sad part of that. See, that is okay. standard operating procedure, that you know, and uh, for this type of thing, it's not like, unusual in the least. And the sad thing is that there's like a person in Hollywood, they're like the studio execs who are going to go pay for that script, but there's not the anti-studio exec who's going to beat those people and throw them in a hole for stealing your idea. <laughs> we need a Hollywood Krampus. I. Well, so you're, you're, this is a tough spot now where you've, everything I've talked about, you've turned into something that's kind of dark and a bummer for you. So here's what I want to know. Uh, like, what is it, like, what can, what can I ask you that you're not going to fuck up for me? <laughs> What's great in your life? What is, you what got is not... kids, right? <laughs> They're gonna be okay, probably. Uh, yeah. is, I, I don't want to imply that this is dark. It's a great deal of fun to do yeah. this stuff, and when it comes out, it is fantastic. That right. is, I'm very excited about Flower Team Kill Team. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, now, yeah, that's, that's more a... of a like kind of a niche weirdo thing, but like, it was great to do, super fun, 
They loved it all the way through. I love the way it came out. So that's the ultimate, that's the happy ending story, and that right. happens every so often. Uh, you know. Right, so you're also, and you're also like planting a lot of seeds, which only one of these has to work to like keep you busy for 10 years, right? It doesn't, it's not like, yeah, I get, this gets picked up and then I go write some more pilots. This so much fun, and it's so much more fun, and this is the reason I don't live in LA, than being on the staff of someone's show and working right. there for, you know, 79 hours a week, uh, and taking orders from the monster, right. you know, which is what happens to a lot of TV writers. This is exactly what I wanted to do, and I have made it happen. So there you go. That is very optimistic and very cool. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Oakley! It's so nice to be here, and I have a bellyache from laughing so much. Um, I'll try and play some songs. Um, I'll, I'll play an old one, and then a, um, I'll try a new one. This is the old one, the safety zone. <laughs> from stumbling back to you and you're safe don't you ever lose your heat don't you ever be kind shedding your skin too soon find me with a milk happy heart Like a war horn out dress with my skin shown through. You guys, they've been chipping away at a songs for a new record. Um, the, the trouble with trying out a new song is that it, um, a week from now, it could have dissolved into nothing or changed um, dramatically. So, um, in this, it will exist as this and, uh, for today. <laughs> In the mud and marsh, drunk on the rhythm of a cricket song. Damn sure about it. Caught in the arm of 
the blue-eyed storm, rain on cloth, on muscle, on bone, we're damn sure about it. We were damn sure about it. We were damn sure about it. Was a shape in the slippery light, a flame on a moth lit moonless night. We were damn sure about it. And love was a half blurred poem you wrote, the oldest brick in the tower of song. We were damn sure about it. Staring at the beaks on the bird face, man. And I'm sitting on a bench with another man, stacking up clues with Clementine. We were damn sure about it. How did we were damn sure about it. You guys have been so wonderful. We got two shows in May, latenightaction.com to find out more about it, Bridgetown and the other one.